Hi there, everybody. Hello. Go ahead. Chip, you can introduce yourself. Go ahead. Hi, this is Chip Taylor. I'm director of Monarch Watch at the University of Kansas. We're part of the Kansas Biological Survey, and I'm also an emeritus faculty member in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. I'm a longtime researcher on uh, insects, uh, particular insect ecology, worked with plants and insects and honeybees, did a lot of work with the so-called killer bees, and for since 19... 92, we've been working with monarch butterflies through a program known as Monarch Watch. And if you want to know more about our organization, you can just uh, go to our website. Uh, we've got a very ancient website. It's a little bit difficult to navigate. Uh, we keep wanting to upgrade it, but uh, we haven't quite got there yet. But uh, there's a lot of information on our website about monarch butterflies uh, and about things in general, such as the topic that we're going to talk about today. So as a uh, participant in TAP, Tribal Alliance for Pollinators, uh, one of the things that Jane and I have talked about is giving a webinar, that, and I've given this before, a webinar about how to propagate milkweeds. Before we get into that uh, in great detail, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Monarch Watch and uh, how we can transition, how we transitioned into uh, creating a lot of uh, uh, habitat for monarch butterflies and why we're doing it. So there's a reason for this conversation today, and that reason has to do with the fact that monarch butterflies are not doing as well now as they were in the past. So we're going to talk about propagating milkweed because we need to replace a lot of milkweed that has been lost in the habitat uh, for monarch butterflies. One of the reasons the population is declining is that we've lost a lot of milkweeds uh, due to changes in agriculture, due to the fact that uh, we are still changing the landscape at a, a rate of about 2 million acres a year in the Midwest. We're losing about a million acres of grassland every year uh, due to landscape changes. We're losing about another million acres due to development. And the effect of that is to take milkweed out of the background, take milkweed out of the habitats for monarch butterflies. Uh, we're losing a lot of pollinator habitat at the same time habitat for ground nesting birds, habitat for all the small mammals that birds of prey feed on and so on and so forth. So we're looking at a kind of a negative cascade in terms of maintaining our, our habitats that produce the pollinators, that produce the fruits, nuts, berries, seeds, and foliage that everything else feeds on. So it's a matter of connectivity that we're all talking about, trying to keep everything connected out there that we have been very good at destroying, actually. Uh, this is one of the things that human beings are really good at, is modifying the habitat, and that's uh, a big threat to nature, and it's a big threat to us in the long term because we need that system out there that supports us. I don't think that uh, there's you know, any ecologist that you talk to will um, deny that. Uh, there is a fundamental ecosystem process out there that needs to be maintained in order to support the human population. And if we neglect that, uh, we do so at our peril. All right, let's talk about monarch butterflies briefly. Uh, you can see here from this graph, it's a little bit out of date, but this graph shows you that uh, the population has been on a fairly particular decline since uh, the, the 90s. We no longer have the big populations that we had in the 90s, and this is due to the loss of habitat. We've also had some changing uh, weather conditions, particularly temperatures in Texas that have had a negative effect on population growth as well. Uh, if you are interested in any of the details about population growth and how insects function, um, you might glance at some of the things I've been posting on the blog uh, at Monarch Watch that kind of explain some of the basics such as uh, realized fecundity and reproductive success, and I'm going to have some other uh, posts on there that talk about the uh, the, fact, the things that happen as plants and insects experience higher temperatures. But it's a complex subject, but it's one that uh, should be of interest to all of us because uh, this is a future that we're going to have to deal with. All right, let's move on. We one of the things that we did uh, in 2005 was create a program called the Monarch Way Station Program. And this shows you one of the early maps. This was in 2015 when we had about 11,600 uh, Monarch Way Stations out there. We created this program, as I said, in 2005. 
took us a while to get uh, leverage on this program and make it go. But now we're up to over 27,000 um, sites uh, across the country. We're, we're doing well. We're adding three to 4,000 sites a year, registered sites. And we know for every registered site, there are two or three other sites that have been created. People just haven't bothered to register them. So there's a movement out there to create habitats for monarch butterflies. We hope you join this movement. Uh, the idea is to uh, get a lot of people involved here. As you can see, uh, there are clusters in these sites, and the clusters are around big cities. You can see uh, San Antonio and Austin represented. You can see Houston represented. You can see Dallas represented there, uh, Kansas City, greater Kansas City area, Minneapolis, St. Paul. You can see those pretty clearly. Those, you know, We appeal to a lot to uh, urban and suburban people, but we really need to reach the countryside. It's the countryside where most of the monarchs are produced. So. Um, you folks, most of you live in the countryside, so we need to enhance the habitat in the countryside that monarchs uh, use, and this is why we're talking today. All right, we've started another program in 2010, and it's called the Bring Back to Monarch Program. Some of you have been participating in this. This is a program that involves uh, large-scale habitat restoration uh, as opposed to the, the Monarch Way Station program, which deals mostly with small gardens and small plots. In this case, we're talking about larger properties, and uh, this is a program that, uh, again, started in 2010. And since 2010, we have distributed approximately a million milkweed plugs. Uh, plugs are small milkweed plants. Uh, and we distributed about a million uh, plants through this uh, program and through uh, the Monarch Way Station program. So we have what is known as a milkweed market. That's a little fuzzy image there, but it's uh, it's what you can see on our website. Uh, if you know of anybody who wants to buy milkweeds, you can go to that particular site. And uh, we work with five nurseries across the country, one in California, uh, one in Kansas, one in uh, Wisconsin, another one in Florida, and uh, another one in Texas, yeah. So we we kind of got the country covered uh, in terms of distributing milkweeds, and we distribute milkweeds on the basis of of the, where they were originally harvested as seeds. So let's talk about the real propagation. Let's now we're getting into the meats, the meat of this particular uh, discussion. We start with collecting seeds, and most of you probably don't have the wherewithal or even know where to buy seeds. So Let's start with what you can find in your fields, in your area, and uh, give you a little uh, heads up as to how to collect them um, and how to how to monitor populations, how to harvest them, and when to harvest. And uh, this is fairly simple. Uh, the harvest takes place when the pods are mature and ready to split or just at the moment that they're splitting. Uh, you don't want to harvest them when they're too green, when the seeds are not ripe. You don't want to harvest them after the seeds have already been uh, attacked by other insects. So this is a field of common milkweed. Uh, it's not ready to harvest. Those pods are are too green. They're not uh, they're not ready to split. If you put your thumb on the seam of the pod, um, if it's ready to harvest, that seam will kind of split open easily. If it's not ready to harvest, that seam won't uh, pop open on you. So this is this is uh, these are common milkweed pods that are ready to harvest for sure. They're they're even uh, maybe just a little past prime, um, and you can harvest uh, seed pods that are a little bit greater than that. What you don't want to do is harvest pods like this. You don't want to harvest pods that are already open, and the reason for that is that you've got these large milkweed bugs that'll come in there, and their job uh, to make a living and propagate their own species is to suck the juice out of those seeds. So they have a sucking mouth part. They stick it right into that seed. They'll suck the living daylights out of the seed and uh, you got a dead seed. So you don't want that. You don't, you don't want to waste your time harvesting seeds that have already been destroyed by insects. So you don't harvest anything that looks like this. And there's plenty to harvest out there. And when you harvest, uh, you put them in uh, breathable bags of one sort. This is these are common milkweed seeds with uh, um, in onion bags. Uh, we we usually use onion bags for making large collections because it might take a day or two to to get those pods uh, spread out. 
And when we do get them uh, back to the lab or the garage or wherever, we like to spread them out and let them dry and, and uh, let them all pop open. And once they're pop, popped open uh, and ready to harvest, then we can go to various harvest methods. All right, these are uh, seeds that are ripe. They're, oh, they look just beautiful. Nobody's destroyed them. This is what a pod that's opened up on that um, greenhouse bench looks like. Uh, it's just ready, ready to harvest. And th there are several ways to harvest now. We'll talk about that. So this is another species that you probably don't see too many of. Uh, this is kind of a northern Midwestern species called Asclepius sylvantii. Uh, they have their pods very tight and they last very long and they turn very black on the on the stems and they're they're out there very often very late in the season about the last thing we ever harvest and you can see the milkweed bugs just waiting for that pod to open up they do feed on the outside of the pod but that has no effect on the seeds uh, what has a real effect is when those pods split open and then they're right in there and you've got a bunch of dead seeds so uh, those milkweed bugs kind of cute but if you like bugs but um, not so much when you're trying to harvest milkweed seeds so this is solvantii and you know this is you don't see any bugs on it but i still wouldn't harvest that uh, i would harvest the pods that are still closed this is uh, tuberosa butter oh, asclepius butter, uh, tuberosa the butterfly weed it's almost ready to harvest it uh, tends to turn a little red at the tops of the pods um, if you put your thumb on those, some of them might split. They're just about ready. And this is Asclepius viridis. This is common in most of Oklahoma. This plant uh, is, those pods are still pretty lush. They're not ready to harvest, not, not probably for a week or more, although they look, they look luscious. But if you open those up, the seeds will be white and not ready. You don't want white seeds. You want seeds that look like this. These are the beautiful seeds of, of antelope horn milkweed. It, it's, it, you know, you look at the symmetry of all of this and it's just beautiful, isn't it? I mean, this is, this, it's wonderful what nature puts together. And uh, I, I can't, you have to monitor, uh, you have to admire these seed pods and you have to admire the, the, the manner of dispersal here. Look at that. Here you've got that silk that's attached to the base of the seed that's designed to carry those seeds on the wind and uh, disperse them so they get to the right place. And you think about every one of those pods, it's got about 200 seeds in it. And you think of the life of these plants and you know many of these plants will live 20 or 30 years or perennials. And think of all of the seeds that they're producing and their objective with all of those seeds produced all of those years and 20, 30, 20 to 30 years of lifetime is simply to replace themselves. One seed out of thousands, out of thousands. I mean, that's the that's the amazing thing about plants. They can they can take uh, in some cases produce a million seeds to get one replacement plant. Amazing biology. And they've got to see one of the reasons that they have problems is you've got these guys out there. And these guys too, these are uh, Aphis nerii. This is an imported uh, insect that came in with uh, oleander plants. Uh, it's called the oleander aphid. Uh, it, it reproduces partially genetically so you, and uh, sexually. Uh, you have, whenever the population is, is stressed, you produce males, they mate. Uh, but otherwise in a population that's growing like this, you can see all those babies there and they're produced by mamas that have not been fertilized. It's tr strictly partner genetic, and it's really kind of uh, bizarre to, to watch these um, aphids closely, if you care to, and watch them pop out fully born, fully functional children <laughs> with all of the body parts there. They're not egg-laying species. They produce live young which is not common in insects for sure. So yeah, there's a lot of wonderful things out there to watch and, um, and appreciate, all right. Well, this is another milkweed that uh, you may see if you get into wetter areas. This is Asclepius incarnata, the swamp milkweed. Again, those pods are not ready to harvest. 
This is a species that you see in a lot in the Midwest. It used to grow in cornfields before they started using uh, Roundup Ready uh, products in those fields. Uh, this is something called Sinantium levy. It's honey vine. It's also called sand vine or blue vine. Uh, this is a plant that uh, often will grow on on fences and on uh, uh, juniper trees and things of that sort. I, I haven't seen much of that in Oklahoma, but it's it's pretty common here in eastern Kansas. Uh, I know it, it goes all the way to the east coast and uh, common up in as far north as Ohio and, and some places, but it drops out a little bit north of Kansas in the Midwest. But it's a very common plant and it uh, doesn't have the appearance of a milkweed until you get to see these pods. And if you see these pods, uh, you know, doggone well, you're looking at a milkweed. No, nothing else makes pods like that. This is a relatively easy plant to grow. It's, it's weedy. Uh, it's, uh, it's interesting because monarchs tend to use it primarily in the fall of the season. And one of the reasons they use it mostly in the fall is that it's a viney species and it stays green. It's, it uh, does not have uh, determinate growth. Determinate growth means that you grow so far and then you stop growing and uh, you produce your offspring in terms of pods and seeds and so on and so forth. This has indeterminate growth, which means that it continues to grow until uh, the season shuts down. And one of the reasons that monarchs use it at the end of the season is that it's one of the few th things that still has new growth on it. And when everything else is senescing or getting old and uh, less desirable to raise your, your caterpillars on. Um, I don't know of anybody that's really propagating this species, but it'd be easy to collect the pods and uh, disperse the seeds uh, along hedgerows and things of that sort to get a habitat enhancement. And this is what a collection of those pods look like. And over there to the left, uh, but about an inch or two from the bottom, you can see a, a seed pod that's just ready to split. See, it's just partially split there. That's what you're looking for, all right? Don't harvest anything that uh, isn't ready to split like that. All right, this is a curious thing. Remember when I showed you all of those pods that had that silk in them? This is a milkweed that occurs along the uh, Gulf Coast of, of the US uh, from uh, probably part of Texas, East Texas to Florida. It's called the Sclepius perennis. It's called the aquatic milkweed. It occurs in a habitat that is quite wet. And you know what? It has no silk. And you know what? It has a neat trick to get those seeds uh, dispersed. First of all, it's the only milkweed plant that I've ever seen in which the pods drop off the plant. All of the other ones, the pods hang on the plant and they open on the plant. And they open on the plant above ground to disperse the seeds on the wind. Well, this one drops the seeds, drops the pods containing the seeds on the wet surface, in the partially flooded areas. And in this case, the pods drift away. They open up at one point, and you have these seeds, which are designed to float. They have big wings on them, and you don't need silk. Wow. So this is a kind of, you know, if you look at this from a evolutionary standpoint, what you would say is, that this is kind of ancestral to, uh, not ancestral, this is kind of derivative from uh, the other milkweeds. This is a special adaptation due to the kind of habitat that this plant has found itself in over the millennia. And uh, it has probably lost the characteristics that uh, it originally had in terms of having silk. It no longer needs silk, rather it needs large fluted seeds. Um, the, the real core of that seed is in that, um, kind of pear-shaped uh, thing that you see in the center of the seed. And then you have those large wings, which are kind of designed to help those seeds float away to get to some place where they can become established. Kind of neat. All right, I'll, let's talk about storing seeds. Seeds must be dry. Uh, you need to store them at about 40 degrees Fahrenheit and with a relative humidity about uh, maybe just a little less than 50%. Well, what does that mean? That means put them in the refrigerator. If you don't have a, uh, any other place to put them, your refrigerator is good, and you can put them in a, in a 
appropriate container, and I'll show you that. Uh, we have, we have, I think we have four refrigerators full of seeds here at Monarch Watch. Well, you want to label the species, you want to label the source and the date, and so on and so forth before you put them in a in a place. But you must be sure that they're dry, and you might have got to put them in to this kind of semi-cool environment with low humidity. Uh, so that they last a long time, and they will last a long time. I have germinated seeds that are 17 years old, uh, so you can you can keep the seeds for a long time in a very viable condition. All right, sorting seeds from the coma or fluff. There are a whole bunch of different methods that you can use. One of which is the paper paper bag method. Supposing you've got say 20 pods or so, what you can do is strip all of the uh, seeds and the coma or fluff into the paper bags and then you can put a few pebbles in there or maybe some coins small coins pennies uh, nickels and then you you close the bag up and you shake the bag vigorously and it's a lot of fun kids can do this and they can bump 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 and you hear everything banging around inside the bag and then what you do is to get to separate the seeds from the fluff is you cut a corner off the bag and you just kind of drain off the seeds. That's uh, simple, it's it's cool, kids can do it, have fun with it, uh, and you can get some really clean seeds that way. Uh, but it's not something you wanna do with a large number of seeds. So what you can do is then you can design some sort of seed sorter, uh, sorter or you can use shop vacs, or you can use trimmers in a bar barrel, and I'm gonna show you all of those. So I, I had some of my students, I challenged some of my students to create a seed sorter and they created a monster seed sorter, all right? Uh, this looks like a torture instrument because you look in there and you say, oh my goodness. I said design something that looks like an old fashioned but butter churn. Well, <clears throat> this thing is designed to spin and you can see all of those screws are designed to rip the coma from the, the seeds and the seeds as they're ripped through there uh, drop through the screen on the bottom. And so after you've done a harvest, you can pull the whole apparatus apart and you've got those seeds on the bottom that you can clean, but you still have to get rid of the floss, right? So what you do, see how this is how it's really put put together. You got two la layers of screws and and um, and the whole thing spins. It's a, it's a monster device. Uh, it looks like something that'd be in a torture chamber. Anyway, um, the kids had fun putting this together. It works reasonably well. And you use a shop vac to pull out the floss. And you can see that the floss has virtually no seeds in it. And then you can decide whether to clean it up a little bit more and make pillows or comforters or something like that because it's, it's good for that sort of purpose. But it's also, um, <laughs> it's also just fun to play with. It's just amazing that you can harvest this stuff like that. But you can do what Elliot Dumbler has done as well. And this is, I laugh every time I see this picture because Elliot had this problem. He wanted to harvest some seeds and he he had more than he, he needed. So he takes a, a grass trimmer with that whip of plastic on the end of it, turns it on, puts the whole mess in the barrel, and then he puts the grass grass trimmer down in there and whips it around. And the thing that happens is this huge plume of floss comes out of this, covers this, covers Elliot, covers the backyard, and you've got all of this stuff blowing away in the air. And it's 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 fun to watch. He's got a little video of it, and it's just it's uh, it's it's just a really delightful thing to see. But I, it's not something I would recommend, but it it obviously works. And uh, you still have to clean up the mess at the bottom of the barrel, but. Uh, it's it's a it's a, a makeshift way of doing it, but it's a, a kind of a if you do it, take a video. It's fun. All right. Well, there's some clean seeds of uh, green antelope horn, and uh, they're again beautiful seeds. And you can see that those flutes on the edge of the seeds are not as big as they are for that perennis that I showed you earlier. And it takes a lot of seeds to make a pound. Uh, this is 1.8. 1.8 pounds of Veritas seeds, and I collected all of that, and uh, boy, it was a lot of cleaning and a lot of what have you, but it, you're not gonna need that many seeds. You're gonna need a few ounces of seeds for most of the projects that you're involved with. Now, one of the things that we do, since we're distributing plants all over the country, is that we 
um, we do it on the basis of where the seeds originated. So there are what are known as ecoregions in the United States, different uh, ecoregions uh, that are characterized by these lines and different colors. And so for region 251, which kind of goes up the, from all the way from Canada down to uh, well into Oklahoma, uh, that's that's a pretty big region. It's a broad region. And what we try to do, if we collect, say, Asclepias viridis seeds from 251, uh, that plant doesn't even grow uh, in North and South Dakota or Minnesota. So we only distribute those seeds in the southern half of 251 where the plant is native. Uh, so what we're doing is collecting seeds from a lot of volunteers, uh, noting where they come from, and then we propagate plants and we try to get the plants back to where the seeds came from in order to keep the ecologically adapted types uh, true to the environment in which they evolved in. So that's that's a thing that we do. It, it makes our life a little hard. I mean, there are a lot of people that don't do that, but we feel that it just it, that's the responsible thing to do ecologically is keep the plants uh, introduced to where they came from. It makes common sense to us. All right. Uh, we have a little problem with that when we get down to Texas. We've got Eastern Texas, which is 255. Uh, and uh, that kind of runs down I-35 and it separates right along the line of I-35 pretty well. And so, if and we produce a lot of plants for Texas and it turns out that the plants that we would normally uh, send to Texas actually occur on both sides of that line, but we try to maintain 315 plants uh, uh, derived from plants that uh, grow in 315 because the soils are different, uh, the climate is different in those areas. So uh, it's it's a matching game and we try to work that out as best we can. All right, this shows the sort of thing that we're dealing with here. Uh, we get lots of seeds in, uh, from uh, various volunteers. And so we have an ID, uh, a data uh, collection uh, and uh, ID is the top, so let's look at the one on the left. That's a Soriaca sample uh, 275. Uh, date of collection was October two, 2015. Ecoregion ER is 212. Uh, the person who uh, the, the location was Taylor County, Wisconsin, and then the this the credit is given to Al and Julie Hillary. All right, so that's that's on all of our all of our seeds and some of these people that send us seeds are really really good at, at cleaning up the seeds and giving us really good seeds other people aren't quite sure what they're sending us because they don't know the species very well and we have to work with that a little bit and some people are not as cautious about you know, giving us really good seeds so we we have to be very careful there is, there is a little knack to telling whether a seed is really a viable seed um, that is if if you have some concern about whether your seeds are really good or not, you you break some open, and if there is still a greenish, whitish inside, uh, they're still viable. If they're brownish inside, or if they're shriveled inside the center of the seed, then uh, you're dealing with things that are no longer viable, and you don't want to plant those. All right, here we're getting to the nuts and bolts of propagation. Stratification. What is stratification? Stratification is needed for Many of the milkweed stratification is a, simply a process by which you uh, take the seeds and treat them in a way that will help them germinate. So the process is simply you take the seeds, you uh, add them to vermiculite that is soaked in water, and then you label it. You, know, you label the source, the date, and you store at a refrigerator temperatures for about 30 days. So this is what it looks like. This is something I put out on my desk to take a picture to show you. You got seeds over there to the left. Uh, and then you got your vermiculite to the right. You get a little water there. You get up. You get a plastic bag. You load it up with the vermiculite. Add just enough water to make the vermiculite saturated. You don't want free water running around in the bag. Uh, then you then you add the seeds. That's too many seeds for that much vermiculite. By the way, I'd use about a third that much. Um, but I wanted to make a nice picture. But anyway, 
uh, you use a small amount of, of seeds and a small amount of vermiculite. You put it in a bag like this, uh, Asclepias syriaca, common milkweed, ecoregion 251, crop 2015, eastern Kansas, stratification 20 March, and you're going to take it out of the refrigerator in 20 April. Uh, 30 days is enough. But what you're doing is that you're kind of cold treating the seeds in a sterile, moist environment. Uh, you don't want to use anything like sand, which might contain fungi. The vermiculite will be um, sterile. And so you want to put them in a sterile media where they could imbibe water and yet uh, experience cold temperatures that will enable germination. It's called stratification and uh, it's required for most of the milkweeds, not all of them, but most of them. Certainly anything that's in the Midwest. Uh, uh, only milkweeds that grow strictly in the south, like that perennis that I showed you, do you not have to use stratification. Termination. Spread the stratified seeds and vermiculite over the seed flat. And so cover with about a quarter inch of vermiculite. Water gently. Keep moist, but not saturated. You want moderate temperatures. Uh, you probably want temperatures that are, oh, in the high 60s to 70s in your germination trays. And the germination should begin in seven to 10 days. So it takes a while for these seeds to um, uh, respond to these conditions, these ideal conditions of uh, moisture and temperature, which will allow them to germinate. This is one of the nurseries we work with in Kansas. And you can see all those germination trays set out there. There's about an inch of vermiculite in these trays. Then you've got the seeds on top of that and about a quarter inch of vermiculite over the seeds. And this is what happens when they start to germinate. Wow, doesn't that look some, like something? I mean, that you know, this is if you really know what you're doing, this is what you can get. Uh, a lot of radicals emerging from seeds, reaching for the soil. The cotyledons are about to pop out in a day or two. The cotyledons are the... Um, the two halves of the seed uh, inside this, two halves inside the seed that are uh, not true leaves, but uh, they represent the the by the the, the two parts of of the seed um, inside the the seed capsule, and then you get the germination here. It's the this flat say butterfly weed, but this is really viridus, uh, viridus one, which means that if in that particular case meant where the veritas was from. And so this is a green antelope horn uh, milkweed seeds. And you can see these cotyledons, these uh, uh, bipartite uh, parts of the seed that have just come out. And what you're looking for is uh, seedlings with first leaves and then second leaves. And when you get the second leaves, this is when you start working with them. So transplant, transplant after the appearance of second pair of true leaves. Use sterile potting soil. Use clean hands and tools. Separate the seedlings carefully. Compress soil gently around the roots. Depth of stem should be the same as germination flat, as in the germination flat. And you could plant, uh, you know, if you're not real handy at this and you're not too sure of yourself, plant two seedlings per cell because you don't want to have a lot of empty cells. And it doesn't matter if you've got two seedlings per cell. Uh, if you want to pinch one off later, you can do that, or you can let two of them grow if they're not interfering with each other. So this is uh, where we had a lot of tribal members at um, the Applied Ecological Services Greenhouse that we have here, Taylor Creek Nurseries here just in Baldwin, Kansas. And you can see Jane way down the line there. And uh, uh, we're getting set to teach everybody how to transplant uh, uh, seedlings of uh, swamp milkweed. And uh, there we are getting instructions on how to transplant uh, seedlings of uh, uh, swamp milkweed. And you can see that there's what's called a dibble stick there uh, that one of the gentlemen is holding. Uh, you can use a pen or anything of that sort. You can make a hole in the um, potting soil and then uh, you could even do it with your finger, but a dibble stick makes a more uniform hole. And then you uh, carefully put the seedling uh, in that hole. And here you can see the fibrous roots. Some of the milkweeds have tap roots. Others have fibrous roots. Uh, the swamp milkweed has fibrous roots. So you kind of tuck those fibrous roots together, drop the whole thing into 
the hole. You can see the hole right below that uh, plant. And then you just gently bring the soil together around those roots. And you, you do it gently. You don't want to tap it really strong. You don't want to compress the roots uh, too much. You don't want to bind it up uh, right away. You want to have it so that the seed, so that the roots can reach out into the rest of the soil. And this is a flat that's already been transplanted. It's taken over into the greenhouse where they can be watered. And they're watered very gently. So they're, they're watered very gently. It's like a gentle rain. And what you do is you just you keep them moist. You don't you don't want to overwater, but you don't want to underwater either. So watering is one of the things that uh, takes a quite a bit of learning. It's, it seems to be very hard to teach people how to water, um, and I'm not sure why that is. But you know, people we, we're not intuitive about what plants need. So you kind of have to learn what they need, and they they don't need too much, and they don't need too too little. They need just the right right amount, and it uh, takes experience to figure that out. So here's a, a nursery that we had in Oklahoma at one time, and they're transplanting Veritas seeds, and they were growing 50,000 plants for us uh, a year for Oklahoma and Texas. And this is what Veritas seedlings look like two weeks after transplanting. Uh, it takes a while after transplanting for these plants to really get going. You can see that uh, some of those uh, um, plugs, uh, plug sites have got two seedlings in them. Others have got one. Uh, maybe one of them didn't make it. So, but they're not empty. So there's, there's, uh, you know, each these are 50 cell trays, and they're producing 50 plants that we can use. So here's one of the cautions that you have to be aware of. You have to be aware of something called damping off. Damping off is caused by soil fungi, and there are about four different genera that, of, of fungi that, if they get into your culture, can really knock it back. Uh, one of the nurseries we worked with had uh, just hundreds of flats planted, and they were hit with pythium, uh, which is a fungus that is most common in these cases, and it, it basically cost them about a quarter million dollars in lost plants. So. You want to uh, have semi-sterile conditions. This is why you use vermiculite rather than sand uh, for your stratification. Uh, you want to use sterile potting soil when you're uh, doing your transplanting and so on and so forth to avoid these problems. If you don't avoid those problems, you get these bare spots in your flats and they tend to grow, the stuff tends to spread. And so this is just the beginning of a, a pythium invasion of these flats and you know by the time uh, you're ready to transplant, and these plants are too young to transplant, but at the time you're ready to transplant, you probably have a tenth or a hundredth of what you started with. Uh, it's not where you want to be. Uh, you want to control that pythium, and there are ways to do that chemically, and you can look that up online, but that's really not the way to go. You don't want to have the pythium to begin with. So if you use sterile soil, you use sterile vermiculite, you should be able to avoid it most of the time. And, and this is what happens when you do avoid it. This is what, what look at that. That's about 45,000 common milkweed seedlings. And what a beauty that is for anybody that's doing what I'm trying to do, produce a lot of milkweeds that we can distribute. All right, there's uh, multiple species represented here. And you can see that this is what a really good greenhouse looks like and when you're producing tens of thousands of milkweeds. So we want to grow those out and transplant them. So growing out uh, and transplanting for uh, six to 10 weeks, uh, depending on, on the conditions. So what we want is roots that are well-developed, well-formed prior to planting or shipment. And we want to uh, cut back foliage on a few of these species so we get more stems. In other words, they will produce more stems or more roots if we cut them back a little bit and it makes them easier to ship. So this is this is what we want to ship. We want to think things that have roots like that. Uh, we got incarnata. We got tuberosa. You can see tuberosa has uh, a tuberous root, whereas incarnata has that fibrous root. And then viridis, which also has a combination. If you look over there on the left of that root, you can see both a tuber and a fibrous root system uh, on uh, viridis. It, that, um, and this is what the plants look like when we're shipping but the incarnata over there to the uh, right. We would cut that one back before we would ship it. 
And a lot of times you, when you get these plants, you want to have them cut back a little bit before you put them in the ground because there is a transplant shock thing that you have to deal with. So you don't want to have uh, plants with a lot of foliage on them because they that means that they demand a lot of water uh, and you're transplanting these plants, their roots are not well established yet. They're not ready to pull up all the water that needs, that is needed to support that foliage. So it's better to cut some of these things back. All right, there's Elliot again with uh, some absolutely fantastic incarnata that he's grown. Those plants should have been cut back. It looks like they were, if you look down at the base of them, it looks like some of them were cut back at one time, but they're still in spectacular shape. We wouldn't ship anything like that without having it cut back. Um, this is another tray of incarnata. You can see that if you look in the center there, just right of, uh, right near the uh, where it says Asclepius carnata, incarnata, you can see that the, there's a, I think the third one from the right there that that has already been cut back. So that's uh, one of the things to do with that particular species more than any other. Then when we ship, we ship things uh, so that they. Uh, UPS can't screw it up too badly. UPS will th throw things. They don't, you know, UPS, I, I love UPS. They do a good job for us, but doggone it, they don't know up from down. At least a lot of the drivers don't. And a lot of the uh, shipping uh, ends up tossed around so much that uh, the plants pop out of these uh, plug trays and we get complaints. Uh, so one of the ways to deal with that is uh, to kind of uh, bag these uh, flats with the net them as best we can, but uh, they still get screwed up if you throw them around too much. So it, it's, but this is the best way to ship them that we know of. So if you're involved with us and we're shipping you plants, this is what they would look like when they arrived. And we send out a lot of plants. Uh, you know, we've been distributing, as I told you earlier, about a million plants since 2010. Uh, there was, sometimes we're sending out, you know, a thousand, two thousand, three thousand a day out of Taylor Creek Nurseries and some of the others. All right, planting, site preparation. And we're getting close to the end here. Site preparation, we want to prepare the sites. Uh, we, you know, the, we got a time of year thing to consider. We want to do it early in the spring. We want to deal with mulching, watering, uh, and we need to talk about a little bit about augmenting soil if that's needed. So this, uh, it's not a milkweed, but it shows you, you know, you put the plant in the ground and you sur sur surround it with mulch. We tend, in, in most of the tribal areas, we use uh, clean straw if we can. It's cheap. Uh, it's the cheapest mulch you can get. Uh, it will keep the moisture in the soil. Uh, it will prepare the plants to uh, survive uh, fairly well. We also use augers, um, and these augers, uh, are really essential if you're planting more than you know a, a few hundred plants. Uh, you know you can plant a few hundred plants getting on your hands and knees, but if you're really planting thousands of plants, which we often are, uh, you want to be using an auger like this because it goes much faster. And one of the reasons we're talking about uh, all of this, of course, is that we're preparing for future droughts. And these milkweeds are deeply rooted. You want to have deeply rooted things on your landscape because they will survive. Uh, those turf grasses and a lot of the introduced species of grasses that you are familiar with over in Oklahoma, for example, uh, are really shallow rooted and they are easily devastated when you, know, you get into drought conditions. Well, that's all I've got. That's all Toto and I've got from Kansas for this little uh, webinar. Uh, we'd be glad to answer questions. And uh, gee, I hope you got some questions. Toto looks like he wants to answer your questions too. All right. Well, thank you very much for being on this uh, webinar, and I hope you got something out of it, and uh, we're uh, willing to take questions. Thank you very much. And you can type in your questions on the little box. And if you want me to unmute you, just also just send a note in the question box and I can unmute you and you can ask your question if you prefer to ask instead of typing. Oh dear, I put everybody to sleep. I don't have any questions. <laughs> I think you're just very thorough and informative. So, oh, okay, there we go. Uh, can you read that question, Chip, or do you want me to read it to you?
Uh, you better read it to me because I can't see it. Okay. So here's a question. Um, how many seedlings can one person reasonably expect to produce? Well, one person, yeah, it depends upon what your facilities are. I mean, one person could easily produce thousands of seedlings if you want to put the time on it. Uh, that's, you know, it's a matter of investment of of resources, isn't it? And the most important resource is probably your own time, uh, your own energy. Uh, but, uh, you know, somebody who's really dedicated to this sort of thing could easily produce thousands of seedlings. Okay. Uh, next question, what time of year is the best to plant? Well, the best to plant it really depends upon your latitude, doesn't it? And so if you were in Texas, you would want to be planting in March. If you're in Oklahoma, you could be planting in uh, in April and May. Uh, up here in Kansas, we're planting. We can't really plant a lot until we get into mid-May. Uh, you go up into, say, a more northerly latitudes, and you'll be planting uh you know, in May, late May, the last half of May and in June. So, yeah, the, you want to be aware of where you are. And the, in Texas, by the time you get into May, it gets hot and dry in a lot of places and uh, requires a lot of watering to keep the plants going. Um, so we try to get those plants in, in the ground uh, as early as you can, depending upon what the temperatures are. Uh, you, you know, the, the plants will grow best at 70s and uh, temperatures in the 70s and 80s. By the time you're getting into the, the 90s and 100s, a lot of these young plants will have a hard time getting established. Okay, and we also have a question. We have Thea Miller says, hello to you, Chip. Uh, Joyce Pearsall, we have a question. Has this been recorded to listen to later on? And the answer is yes. Uh, we will send out an email after the webinar with a link to it, and there will also be a link on the TAP website, which is tapconnection.org. Um, next question, where can we find or purchase the vining pods uh, on the milkweed? The, I guess the, uh, the blue vine. The blue vine. I don't know if anybody's selling the blue vine, um, but if you know somebody who lives in a blue vine area, um, or if you live in a blue vine area, you, you look at you know, hedgerows, look on fence Look on uh, fence lines, uh, look, uh, you know, if I want to find it in Lawrence, Kansas, I go down alleyways and I look at the back fences and I look on the juniper bushes. Or if I go to the schoolyards and I look at the fencing around the schoolyards or the, the shrubbery around the schoolyards, which tends not to be well tended, which will often have vines in it. It used to be that we had a lot of blue vine growing in cornfields. I got a call one day from a farmer and he said, why do I have all these monarch chrysalises in my corn? They're, they're hanging all over my corn. That's what they're doing. And I said, well, sir, you've got some milkweed growing in your cornfields. He said, no, I don't. I don't. I ain't got no milkweed out there. And I said, well, I'd say you better go back and look again, because if you have pods hanging from your vines that are growing on your plants, uh, you've got blue vine or sand vine or you know, the honey vine, what they call it. It's a milkweed. Oh, really? Yeah. So we had this interesting conversation uh, educating this guy. He thought he had bindweed out there. And it's not bindweed. It was in, it was blue vine. And it had uh, it had hosted a lot of monarch caterpillars that were pupating on his cornfields and he couldn't understand his corn and he couldn't understand why. But anyway, that's you know, it looks a lot like bindweed, except that the vines are a little bit more robust and they have distinctive flowers and they produce those nice pods. Okay, and there was a comment from Carol Clark that blue vine almost always has young plants coming up near the parent plant that can be transplanted. So, ah, that's a that's good. Yeah, yeah, very, yes. very good tip. Yeah, uh, so, so I'm curious as to whether blue vine grows where Carol Clark lives. It must be that she has that experience. Okay, I know we've got it around here. Um, she said yes, yes, an enthusiastic yes. So, okay. Okay. Um, we have another question. Is it best to produce plants that you find right in your own area? Yes, that's what we recommend. Uh, take the seeds from your own area. They're well adapted to your area. They've lived there for we don't know how many thousands of years, and uh, they're, they're adapted to the climate. Uh, climate is changing. We know that. But uh, for right now, yes, use the stuff that uh, grows in your area if you can. 
Next question, where can people purchase milkweed from Monarch Watch? Well, you can go to uh, monarchwatch.org and you can go to the milkweed market right on our webpage. And you can click on that and see what is involved in connecting with Angie Babbitt. She's the person who's in charge of the milkweed market and she can help you get milkweeds that are appropriate to your area. Okay. Um, next question from Thea Miller. Uh, may we have a copy of your PowerPoint? <laughs> Thea. <laughs> I love you, Thea. But <laughs> All right. I'll let you deal with that with Thea one-on-one. -on -one. All right. No, no, I, no, I would be happy to share with Thea. That's not a problem. <laughs> All right. Uh, there's another question. If we have questions, can we call you or Jane? Yes, especially Jane. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, thanks. Okay, next question from uh, Ray Morans. I haven't grown verticillata successfully yet, but have ordered a flat from Milkweed Market. Any tips for growing verticillata in Oklahoma, central Oklahoma? Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, verticillata is a little bit harder to grow than many of the others are. Uh, for those of you who don't know that plant, I mean, you can look it up on uh, on the website. It's got very thin. It's got very thin leaves. Uh, it uh, almost looks like grass if you're in a, a prairie sort of setting. Uh, it is a milkweed that is used by monarchs uh, typically late in the season. Has nice white flowers. Uh, does reasonably well in a in a garden, and it tends to clone. There are not very many milkweeds clone, but this one sends out rhizomes and will clone. And so, uh, if you get plants established, you can get small groups of plants established because of these rhizomes will kick out from the main plant and so you'll get new plants a few inches away from the old plants. Um, I, you know, I do, don't have any specific advice. Uh, all the nurseries that we give seeds to that grow verticillata use the same procedure that I talked about for growing all the other milkweeds and they get it to germinate. Uh, so I would go back to the drawing boards in terms of stratification and try that a couple more times to see whether that will work for you. Okay, and then uh, and then Carol Clark also had a comment about that about it should not be giving any problems because it's thicket forming, which I think uh, you were saying in a different way. Um, uh, another question: Do I need a large amount of area between the plants due to the large root systems? I don't think so. I, it, uh, a lot of these plants will grow uh, pretty well, uh, fairly close together. Um, we tend to have them spread out because it works a little bit better for the butterflies. The butterflies uh, tend to prefer plants th that are spread out and that, that actually uh, probably enhances the survival of caterpillars that are feeding on them. Um, uh, butterflies tend to move from place to place and their movement distances from one place where they set down to lay an egg to another is uh, often considerable. So, um, you know, I, I wouldn't worry about Either crowding the plants, well, you might worry a little bit about crowding the plants too much, but I, I would guess I, I would prefer to have the plants spread out as much as I possibly could within a reasonable uh, distance of each other in a garden. Okay, uh, next question, somebody, I think that I have seen slash collected some honey vine in Oklahoma. Is there another species that it could be? The pods have the silky floss and the seeds appear to be very similar to Viridus. Yeah, it does grow in Oklahoma. Uh, most, uh, I don't know how far south it grows. If Carol Clark has got it in, in Texas, then it grows throughout Oklahoma. But I haven't looked up the distribution map. Uh, I would imagine that it's not very common in western Oklahoma. It's just too dry out there. But uh, eastern Oklahoma, it, it, um, it probably grows through eastern Oklahoma down into Texas. Um, that would be my guess. And uh, yeah. You go ahead and use it. It should it should uh, easily propagate itself if you scatter the seeds in the uh, areas that are appropriate for it, uh, such as along those margins that I talked about, where it has something to climb on. And Carol Clark made the comment that Punastrum, I'm not familiar with that plant, can be confused for honey vine. Yeah, there is another milkweed species or a species in that group. It's not an Asclepius. Uh, which is viney that does look like um, a cynanchum. And yeah, that is a problem. I've tried to grow milk, uh, monarchs on those various other species and uh, the, it doesn't work. You've got to have the right plant. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, I think I don't see any more questions being typed in. If you've got any more, we're we have time for a couple more. Um, if not, uh, I will also mention to you to save the date for our next TAP workshop and conference, which are going to be April 2nd and 3rd. I'll be sending out the announcement hopefully later today or tomorrow. Uh, we'll have a hands-on workshop with field work and, and uh, with a big focus on uh, controlling invasive species on the 2nd. And then the 3rd will be a conference style event. And our keynote speaker is going to be Pat Gwynn from the Cherokee Seed Bank uh, talking about uh, all the things they've got going on there. And and Dr. Taylor will be a presenter on some other fascinating stuff with climate change and rising temperatures in monarchs. So it, it should be a great couple of days. Registration will be opening soon. Um, and I think that's about everything we've going on. Uh, Chip, do you have anything else you want to add? No, I I, I, I hope this was useful. And um, you know, you know fire away with the questions. Uh, we'll stammer through them somehow with the answers. But uh, we. We've been at this a while, so we can help you with most of these things. Okay. Uh, okay. And we got to thank you, Jane and Chip from Patty. Thank, thank you, Patty and Thea. Okay. Oh, here's one more question. Um, uh, I do not have the space to cultivate small milkweed plants to hand out, but I do share my seeds with folks that want to develop their own monarch gardens. When is the best time to plant those seeds? Fall? That's a good question. I, yeah. I would prefer late winter to fall. Uh, and the reason for that is that most seeds are lost due to attack by fungi of one sort or another. You know, we talked about how many thousands of seeds a plant uses to replace itself. You know, they're, they're selected to produce seeds in abundance so that in their lifetime, they will replace themselves with at least one seed. Uh, why do they do that? Because there's a lot of mortality out there. There's there's tremendous seed mortality, and it's it's astronomical actually. Um, it's like 99%, 99.9%. So what you want to do is give the seeds the best possibility of making it to the next season and germinating. And I prefer to scatter those seeds out a late winter, past past the midpoint of the winter, rather than in the fall. And the reason for that is that if you put them out there in late winter, there's a good chance they will stratify. It's a good chance the birds and the bugs and the fungi won't get them before uh, the seeds actually germinate. Okay. Oh, wait, we've got one more question here. I live in central Oklahoma. When is the best time to start here? Uh, January. <laughs> Yeah, really, to, to, you know, it, to, to produce these plants takes about three months uh, if you're going to do it from the, the, the whole thing from stratification on because you've got about a month of stratification. You've got about uh, two weeks of growing them out to the second leaf stage. And then you've got about another uh, two to three months of growing them out in a greenhouse uh, to that well-rooted stage. Uh, if you're doing this in your kitchen or what have you, you could start right now and uh, still uh, still have stuff, but you'd be planting kind of late. You'd have to nurture these things because you probably wouldn't be planting them until sometime in late May. Uh, but that would be all right if you've got a garden and you're putting them in a garden and you can watch them and water, you know mulch them well and water them as needed. Yeah. And uh, just, it's kind of past it now, but normally we do a lot of, and we, as we did this year, uh, tap workshops, hand on, hands-on workshops where you can come in and uh, at our greenhouse, we'll show you how to put the stuff into stratification. We'll show you how to set up the germination trays. We'll show you what the seedlings look like in the process. We'll review, you know, hands-on care for those plants and, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, it's very informative to hear all this, but sometimes it's good to just get your hands dirty with it and see it in person too. Yeah, so that's, that's what it, we're here it, for. Yes, it's all, you know, it's all experience. I mean, none of this stuff is, you know, it, it's, it's super hard, but it's not, you, know, you can make a lot of simple mistakes in it. Uh, just timing, watering, what have you. Just as, a, as an incident, incidental thing, you know, we've got about 150,000 milkweeds already started this year with the nurseries we're working with. And, uh, we sent uh, seeds to those nurseries in uh, December and January, and they started stratification then. 
so that they can have everything ready at the earliest possible date for the people they're working with. Um, as a homeowner or as a, a person working on tribal lands, you don't need to do it that, and you probably don't have the facilities to do that. But you could start stuff now indoors and get to the point where you get them to germinate, and then you could transplant them, uh, get them going for, say, three or four weeks as a transplant so they get some roots going. And you don't have to have plants quite as robust as we do on a kind of a semi-commercial basis, but you could get plants that are, uh, say, four or five weeks old, uh, and get those into gardens or restoration plots, take good care of them, and they'll make it. Right. Um, and we may have some extra plants, not a lot, but some for tribal projects. If you're you know, working in Oklahoma, um, just let us know about that. Get in touch with us over here at TAP, and we can maybe help you out with some extra plans too. So, all right, I think if there's no more questions, then we are done with our webinar. But thank you so much, Dr. Taylor, for that. That was a fantastic webinar. And as I said earlier, it will be recorded. If you'd like to go back and see it later or share it with others, just uh, you'll get it at the link in your email, follow up email. We'll also have a survey for you to follow up with if you don't mind taking the time to answer that. And then the uh, recording, the webinar will be posted on the TAP website, tapconnection.org. So with that, um, thank you very much and uh, have a great rest of the day. And goodbye, everybody. We'll see you again.